Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Sandeep Kaur, and I would like, I would again welcome you all. I hope you all are keeping well in this new normal. Our today's webinar is on pulse wave velocity, and for this, we have with us an incredibly young and dynamic research scientific from Healthcare Technology Innov Innovation Center, HTIC, IIT Madras, and he is none other than Dr. Nabil PM. Dr. Nabil receives his PhD degree in electrical and electronics engineering from Government Engineering College, Revendram, Kerala, in year 2012, after which he received his MSc degree, PhD in biomedical, in biomedical engineering, uh, just excuse me. Dr. Nis Dr. Nabil received his PhD degree in electrical and electronic engineering from Government Engineering College, Trivandrum, Kerala in 2012, after which he receives his master's degree and PhD in biomedical instrumentation from IIT Madras in 2019. He is majorly working on cardiovascular systems and developing intelligent in technologies for non-invasive calibration-free cuffless measurement for blood pressure. His work is of global significance as it was in response to the grand challenge initiated by NIH USA and DST India in 2014. As a recognition of his work's mastery and scholarship, he was awarded IIT Madras 2018 and 19 Institute Research Award. Currently, he is working on physiological experiment, human animal trials, clinical investigations, hardware projects involving sensors, instrumentation, medical device development. His research interests include biomedical physics, mathematical modeling, simulations of physiological systems, cardiovascular sciences and engineering, medical instrumentations and sensors development, and signal processing for biomedical applications. His scientific contribution reflects in the scope and quality of over 55 publication, as well as two issued and 22 pending patents. So we are honored to have you, sir. Uh, after this, I'll have a small general instruction for the participants who are joining our webinar for the first time. If you have any question during the presentation of Dr. Nabil, please type them into the tech question answers box in the control panel, which is available in the control panel. We'll bring them up during the webinar and we'll discuss this also in the question answer session at the end of the webinar. So now I'll hand over this webinar to Dr. Nabil. Over to you, Dr. Nabil. Yeah, thank you, um, Sandeep Kaur, for your wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. And uh, I would like to thank your instrument team for inviting me as a speaker during your international webinar series. Um, hello, dear participants. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Kindly accept it depending upon where we are currently. I hope all of you are doing great and spending healthy time with your family during this uh, global tough time. And uh, we are wishing and hoping for a uh, you know, new normal and uh, a great year ahead. Okay, so today I'll be spending about 40, 45 minutes on discussing our topic, uh, pulse wave velocity, the theoretical aspects and uh, measurement and uh, methodological considerations associated with the pulse wave velocity, and uh, some practical examples. And I will also uh, discuss some research uh, output and uh, you know, challenges we faced at uh, um, HDIC, IIT Madras, and uh, some of the devices we have developed in house towards measuring uh, pulse velocity, specifically on a you know, very specific and interesting area of pulse velocity. Then as um, Core has mentioned, you can have a question answer sections after that. Uh, if you have any specific queries, you can pause there. I would be happy to address all of them as far as possible. And um, you know, if more number of questions are there, it will be appreciated if you can give your email ID along with that so that I can reach you at a later time. Okay. Uh, Yes, so I will be starting with the basic uh, discussion about the cardiovascular disease and the global status of the cardiovascular disease and the need for an early vascular markers uh, for a better controlling and management of uh, this uh, cardiovascular disease uh, progression 
then we'll go with an introduction to pulse wave velocity we will specifically discuss about the terminology is called regional pulse wave velocity and local pulse velocity and this topic uh, this talk will more focused on the basics of the local pulse velocity its clinical applications and the measurement and methodological considerations associated with the local pulse velocity evaluation then of course i will be discussing some of uh, the sensors uh, their design development and um, you know in vivo and in vitro validation of uh, sensors for local pulse velocity okay uh, yeah i think this statement cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of um, uh, death worldwide is a widely used i should say it's an overused statement in most of the scientific literature of cardiovascular domain i'm i'm sure that all of you in this webinar must have heard about this particular statement or must have seen in this statement in almost all the publication or articles which are dealing with the cardiovascular screening device development epidemiology risk stratification etc i mean basically some uh, article which is uh, pointing towards the need for developing something Uh, to control the disease progression this trend has started uh, you know almost early 2000s in this 21st century so um, other than you know most of the introduction sections will have this statement what is actually mean and how dense or how intense it is so called the leading cause of death so let us have a, a numbers by who so i think all of you are aware of this big numbers that about 17.7 million people are dying every year annual death rate is actually um, so high due to the cardiovascular diseases or its related complications it is about 31 percentage of the global deaths so that's actually a big number um so to give an idea um at actually towards the uh, end of 90s or early 21st century the cardiovascular disease has become and it, of course it is continued to be the leading cause of mortality and morbidity and uh, you know end organ damages and everything um among the non communicable diseases that's the point to be noted here um of course there are other um, uh, you know causes of death which we will not consider and uh, during this presentation so this death rate or uh, the contribution to this huge number are actually um is from the middle income or low income countries towards the uh, start of 21st century um you know the developed countries are more suffering due to cancerous related uh, diseases and of course cardiovascular disease also uh, is comparable to the same uh, rate now when it is when you say um, the death rate or the disease uh, what it actually uh, causing for a, uh, you know socio economic uh, background in fact this is a severe socio economic burden for a country or a um, um, you know a government organizations because nowadays especially in recent years after this 21st century young younger population at the age of about for less than 40 45 years are prone to are more prone to cardiovascular diseases compared to uh, the older population above 60 years of course above 60 years it is expected um because um you know it is your your body is is aging along with your arteries and other organs heart everything will become age and that age related uh, degradation will be there that's accepted but when disease has happening at a early stage like you know less than 40 45 years i myself have a friend who uh, expired uh, at the age of 23 years um when uh, due to the cardiac arrest that was so shocking so what happened that it is um in, if it is disease affecting for a, a younger population it is actually affecting the most productive years of their life so somebody who has a disease at the early stage of just 25 or 29 you know rest of the life they have to adjust and uh, with medicines with maintaining their activities the productivity will be compensated or it will be compromised so that eventually degrade the real asset of a country the vibrant young manpower of a country so there comes the importance of socio economic burden on the cardiovascular diseases now when we say cardiovascular diseases is, is a big umbrella as you can show in my um, illustration here it's a cluster of various disease or associated disease conditions uh, for example the coronary heart disease uh, you know peripheral vascular disease stroke hypertension or uh, there are many so 
um controlling and managing all of these diseases or um, you know associated conditions at a global level it's not a trivial task it's accepted and so it's, it, it, because we have gone beyond that particular stage because we have already reached as the number one or leading cause of the condition however it should be appreciated that various scientific communities government organizations the health organizations has put um, significant and measurable global headway in the prevention of various cardiovascular diseases unfortunately appreciating their work and their effort and their uh, you know all um, awareness uh, everything the current rate of success uh, in controlling the disease especially the cardiovascular uh, disease is insufficient i should use that term it is insufficient to attain what is the actual uh, objective of these uh, communities i mean it was the early 2010s and all the objective was to Uh, you know control the cardiovascular diseases at least one third of the current rate and you you know that over the past years it has been exponentially increased and i mean it has no symptoms of controlling up to 1 by 3rd of um, you know as per the target by 2030 it is uh, as per the current rate um, like expert opinion is saying that it is uh, nearly impossible to uh, reduce up to that much or even a decade after so there's something which we have to think about of what is going uh, where are we lacking um, in terms of controlling and managing this kind of a disease uh, and important point that like i mentioned is a non communicable diseases so fundamentally there is a, there exists a pressing need to improve our classical strategies like you know how conventionally we are uh, how are we treating a cardiovascular disease we will see whether the guy is gone a hypertension or accidentally when there is a medical checkup or something this guy will found that okay he has a um, his um, um, the cholesterol or other um, risk factors are high then we'll go for cardiovascular checkup and maybe he will uh, come we will already at a later stage of cardiovascular disease that's how our classical strategies so um once you diagnosed with a cardiovascular disease yes there has been a significant improvement in the technological advancements in the uh, in the device um, intervention device management later stages i mean after identifying the guy has already has a cardiovascular disease you have many things but when uh, is it possible to identify before coming to that stage that is the question so there exists a pressing need to change our uh, conventional method for risk stratification and early stage screening and diagnosis of the cardiovascular diseases um like i said we will not be able to cover all strategies for different different categories of the um, you know cardiovascular conditions in my talk today i'll be focusing how we can bring new strategies or measurement beyond the conventional approach for screening vascular conditions more specifically uh, the arterial uh, diseases so let us uh, go start with this uh, illustration the need for an early vascular health markers um, as you can see here um, this illustration will give you um, a brief idea where are we missing the early stage screening of vascular condition or artery diseases even though Uh, such conditions are arises early um, like about 10 years before as, as per recent studies in indian population and in the asian population uh, the symptoms or the changes in the arteries are happening like almost 10 years earlier before occurring a adverse event so even if you look at this illustration from a normal artery uh, when you uh, see from a normal artery when it is being going through different phases and finally is coming into a severe um, adverse events like after forming some thrombosis there are multiple stages so like from a normal artery it will go to a fatty stray condition then plaque deposition will increase then uh, you can see an increased plaque deposition then uh, going into uh, you know the level degree of uh, plaque deposition and the obstructions are going so high now what is happening there our conventional risk factors if you remember uh, something called the you know uh, framingham risk score fsr or our systemic coronary risk evaluation uh, something called a score all those parameters or even blood pressure all these measurements will be um, so called the conventional risk factors will be uh, you know showing normal values up to this stage 
I mean, during the um, early uh, stages of arterial stiffening. So um, after that, you are um, you will be start seeing a deranged risk markers. Uh, you know, when your atherosclerotic plaque uh, deposition is so high, which is uh, sufficient enough to increase your blood pressure um, at a peripheral level, because we all of you know that we are performing the blood pressure from the brachial artery for a clinical application. So it will take significant time to show up a blood pressure increase. Um, um, I mean, um, from the beginning of your arterial dysfunctions. Now, interestingly, you can see as soon as there is a fat streak starting, your endothelial functions will start to misbehave. There will be an endothelial dysfunction will start occurring. So that will be the first stage uh, when there is a, um, you know, artery walls are getting ruptured or it is getting plank deposition. At, uh, as it is progress, your stiffness of the artery will start changing. Your elastic property of the artery, especially your central arteries. I mean, the uh, I think you are aware of what central arteries and peripheral arteries and all the arteries which are close to the uh, or proximal to the heart, like your aorta, carotid, all those arteries. Those stiffening of the arteries are gradually start increasing. Then if we have a measurement methodology or uh, some uh, strategy where you can identify this endothelial dysfunction or arterial stiffening at a very early stage. Of course, some of our uh, risk markers will be able to identify the arterial stiffness at a later stage, uh, but I'm talking about the very early stage. So if we have some technology or some other measurement modality to perform such a measurement at the early stage, then we will be in a good position to identify the people at risk it, of course, it has to happen at a field level or a population level screening. We have to go to the, um, you know, our country's population, do a mass screening. We'll have to identify who are having uh, this development of uh, cardiovascular diseases because mostly that is associated with their lifestyle changes, uh, some genetical um, disorders. All those things will affect the formation. But if we are waiting for the patient to come to the hospital, then it must have been somewhere in a different stage. Then prevention or uh, prevention will be slightly difficult or the reversal of the arterial stiffness itself will be difficult. So that's my point. So there are some uh, physiological measurements like uh, arterial complaints, arterial distensibility, and of course our topic pulse flow velocity, which starts showing some deranged values when the arteries material property are uh, started changing. So that is called the arterial stiffening. So these markers are associated with the stiffness of the artery. So this is about a very, uh, you know, um, surface level idea about what is the importance of pulse flow velocity. Now, uh, let us go to our actual topic. Uh, as you can see here, the pulse flow velocity by definition, it is the rate of propagation of the blood pulse through the arterial walls. Of course, it is a measure of the arterial stiffness. In addition to that, during your systolic phase of a cardiac cycle, when uh, the ventricle contraction happens, it ejects a certain volume into the um, ascending iota or the arterial tree. The generated arterial pulses, when how fast they are propagating through the arterial tree is termed as pulse -ver velocity. So this pulse -ver velocity is actually a measure of your material property of the artery itself. If you have a stiffer artery, the, the pulse velocity value will be uh, different. It will be slightly higher compared to your normal elastic artery. Now, uh, this measurement of the pulse velocity is again proportional to the transmural blood pressure level. I mean, the net pressure experienced by your um, artery walls, how much is the pressure is, I mean, it's not, it is slightly different from your blood pressure because uh, you will have some other tissue and surrounding uh, or smooth muscles, uh, the, co the contribution of the smooth muscle on the wall and the blood pressure. What is the difference between that? Will give you an estimate of the transmural pressure. Again, that is a measure of your material property of your uh, circulatory system. So pulse velocity is actually proportional to that uh, transmural pressure level. Then it is also a uh, measure of your dynamic pressure diameter gradient, how uh, your uh, artery is able to accommodate, I mean, something called the vincusalness of the artery, accommodate the volume expansion with the respective pressure expansion. So it is a function of that. And more importantly, it will give you uh, or it will reflect a, an overall hemodynamics of your circulatory system.
so um multiple studies have reported and studies are still continuing we'll come to that later that uh, saying that the age or you know due to changes in the any other changes in the arterial walls the vessels become stiffer and the speed at which this pulse velocity move through the system will be increased that itself is a measure of your health uh, condition of the artery so that is the importance of pulse velocity in a snapshot we'll go in deep so let me start with uh, the one of the classic experiment um, conducted in 1922 by jc bramwell and ab hill who was uh, considered to be the first uh, people who quantified and introduced the concept of uh, pulse velocity so their experimental setup is quite interesting a symbol but it is a classic uh, at the time of 1922 so what they have is an excised artery from the common carotid segment of an adult which is attached to a copper pipe um and the both end are attached to a copper pipe which is then connected to a, a mercury reservoir where they have also arranged one uh, excuse me yeah so they have also arranged um, some writing lever at this point a as well as at the point b now this uh, experiment is very interesting so they will push push um, with a certain pressure this mercury a pulse uh, wave or i mean a wave of the mercury will be generated and it will be propagating through this copper pipe as soon as it is reaches the artery segment it will propagate uh, as the form of an uh, typical artery pulses and reaches at b the moment this pulse reaches a will be marked by this uh, you know writing lever and the moment it is reaches at uh, b will be marked uh, by the writing lever at that section so uh, you know already what is the length of the artery and you know what is the time taken by the time delay between the first spike from a and second spike from b knowing that time delay you can evaluate pulse velocity so this was done by bramwell and hill and they have repeated the experiment for a different conditions of the artery i mean you know, stiffer arteries different pressure levels and finally they concluded that the transit velocity of the pulse wave depending on the extensibility of the vessel means the elastic property of the vessel as modified by any condition any condition which mean it can be a material property or it can be a functional property at the time of measurement and finally they come up with an expression is a well known expression for pulse velocity known as the bramwell hill equation of course we have a different modified versions of the bramwell hill equation which will be discussed in a subsequent slides so this experiment uh, is giving you the relationship between uh, pulse wave velocity and the pressure the distensibility of the artery and the volume of the arterial segment so this will in in some it will accommodate your your uh, your uh, you know dynamic property uh, of the pulse propagation and the material property as well so this is considered as a one of the classic example and classic experiment in biomechanics so after this experiment and publishing the paper in 1922 in the royal society so there have been a significant interest in uh, measurement of the pulse velocity in human bodies so as you can see here all the way from 1922 there have been you know considerable um, number of publications as you reach 2000s there is a drastic increase in the research interest of uh, pulse velocity and um, last year we have close to 1200 publication when you search with the term pulse velocity or abbreviation pwv so about 1200 papers published in 2020 um i mean it would have been higher if this unfortunate situation didn't happen so there is a drastic increase why there is a significant increase after 2000 we'll come to that because um, it is uh, because of drastic uh, change in our technological advancements technological advancements in the domain of biomedical instrumentation computing capability all those things so um i i am introducing the term called regional pulse wave velocity here which actually defining the transit velocity of the pulse wave through a long arterial segment as i shown here for example you are taking all the way from the aortic root then uh, descending and uh, you know abdominal till the iliac artery so that's a very long segment so when you measure the pulse velocity over long segment for example another branch we can have maybe from the carotid all the way up to the femoral artery 
or it can be from carotid all the way up to your radial artery such a long trajectory is where multiple branches are occurring that is um, termed as regional pulse velocity it is a very well established marker of your arterial stiffness and uh, it is actually provide a you know reliable prognostic parameter for uh, cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in a variety of adult population including older uh, adults uh, patients with in end stage renal diseases diabetes hypertension it has it is a well established and of course you can see that number of publications has been you know significantly higher in uh, in recent years after 2000s recently there have been a significant studies and uh, publications uh, by uh, you know emphasizing the importance of regional pulse velocity as an indicative of early vascular aging eva so um, this term has uh, you know is a recently uh, familiar and popular people are discussing about the aging of your artery or vessels in comparison with your actual chronological age so your chronological age is not a synonym or it is not interchangeable with your age of your artery age of your artery is nothing but the rate of degradation of its material properties so uh, when our arteries are started affecting some disease conditions its degradation rate will be significantly higher than our normal chronological age um, for example um you know somebody who has an age of 30 may have an artery which is uh, aged up to some you know uh, uh, 60 years so the artery uh, feel is age as 60 years and its performance will be degraded and that is why we actually started seeing you know premature death due to cardiovascular uh, diseases now uh this kind of a regional pulse velocity estimation will provide an average compliance of your entire arterial system for example if you are measuring uh, your uh, pulse velocity all the way from your carotid to the uh, tibial artery all the way long segment it will give you uh, the an idea about your complete arterial system that is the beauty of regional pulse velocity um as i said there have been a significant studies reported after 2000s and uh, you know multiple communities and effort by researchers has established a so called gold standard estimate for pulse velocity which is considered as the carotid femoral pulse velocity which means when you measure a pulse from your carotid artery like this the blue indicator one and you perform another one from your femoral artery because that you are getting a very a long straight uh, trajectory to uh, for the artery to pulse and calculate the time delay between carotid to femoral pulse and knowing the distance between the carotid and femoral artery you can calculate the pulse wave velocity which is the distance by time so your total distance and the time of course the total distance is not like a straight uh, distance there are some other calculations to be taken care um i have not included such detailed uh, um, informations here which are readily available in uh, article is expert consensus document on arterial stiffness so european heart journal has published that article um that is a must read article those who are interested in the uh, you know pulse velocity domain so so please don't consider the distance as a straight as it is um, i have mentioned on that now um, like i said this is a gold standard estimate because there is no other estimate so this is the gold standard so far and there have been multiple effort by different researchers to come up with some reference values is like our blood pressure when pressure when you say as per the rate in i mean american heart association you have 80 130 or 130 bar 80 is considered as your uh, you know normal Uh, blood pressure condition similarly we have normal values is for the pulse wave velocity so it has been taken about some 1455 subjects you can see that as the age is changing your artery is will become a older and older your pulse velocity is expected to increase so somebody who as at the age of 30 can have a pulse velocity between 5 and 10 and uh, it can increase all the way like this that is a normal range for 30 years population but as uh, similarly when uh, somebody who are at an age of uh, you know 60 69 is expected to have a pulse velocity between some 10 and 15 so it is an age dependent parameter it is um, it has to be an age dependent parameter because your artery material properties will degrade as your as your aging now when somebody who at the age of 30 has a pulse velocity in the range of 10 to 15 which means that the subject is uh, chronological age is 30 years but is his artery is aged up to 60 or above 60 years so that is was the um, you know vascular aging i have mentioned 
so um, i hope you understand that concept then again uh, the same paper uh, published in the european heart journal in uh, 2010 has reported values is obtained from 11092 subject where the reference values of the pulse velocity is expressed in terms of uh, the age as well as the blood pressure condition somebody who are at the age of 70 years with normal bp is expected to have a pulse velocity up to somewhere in close to 11 uh, then somebody at the same age with a higher bp is expected to have a pulse velocity at some somewhere in 30 so these values as are pressure dependent uh, age dependent and there are other factors also required to consider when you you know define your uh, normative ranges for pulse velocity that is uh, ongoing study uh, how your uh, genetical properties are affecting your pulse velocity uh, you know how uh, your birth weight is going to affect your pulse velocity all those parameters has um, is required to be uh, consider um, uh, i mean that is again a different topic for detailed discussion uh, let us skip into the next topic and that is the important topic of the um, this presentation because we are focusing on local pulse velocity so what it mean by local pulse velocity so like i said the regional pulse velocity you will be measuring over longer arterial trajectory when it comes to local pulse velocity your focus will be on a specific target artery for example as i show here in the common carotid artery look at this i have uh, i have an mri image of the carotid artery and i marked the two um, section where there is no significant branching this can be somewhere about some 5 to 10 cm about some 50 mm to 100 mm i will be calculating at what speed the pulse is propagating through this segment alone and named as common carotid local pulse velocity similarly if i do an analysis on my aortic arc so i can see that how fast the blood will be propagating from the aortic arc to till the abdominal section and i will claim it as the um, local pulse velocity of the aortic arc maybe if i can go i can do an analysis at the abdominal aorta where um, i can again calculate the pulse velocity of the abdominal aorta so that is the important point here the transit velocity of the pulse work through a specific artery this will give you a quantified um, characteristic features of individual arteries so for a same subject if you perform the measurement at the common carotid for local pulse velocity that will not be same or magnitude wise will not be equal to that of your abdominal aorta so this will give you a characteristic uh, features of the target artery for example uh, there are uh, you know interesting studies in uh, recent years Uh, which quantify something called the sublocal uh, sublocal pulse velocity suppose your plaque formation is happening or some thrombosis or uh, you know or aneurysm is happening on a specific uh, segment you can go and measure the local pulse velocity and quantify its um, stiffness or its other condition of the target section and interestingly there are applications like suppose you have inserted a stent then you want to evaluate the performance of the stent um to the arterial system you can perform the local pulse velocity of that particular segment alone then you can quantify how the stent performance um post operation performance of the stent so that is the uh, advantage of performing um, pulse velocity on a you know on a very smaller arterial segment so um yeah this like i said it will give you a pathophysiology of an artery under investigation and in recently or as you can see in this graph only in recent years the interest on the local pulse velocity has gained attention similar to the increment sorry in, similar to the local pulse, regional pulse velocity uh, there have been some studies reported uh, in 90 after 1950 uh, i think around 1955 is the first paper is coming on local pulse velocity from there you have you know less than 10 number of papers or even less than five numbers of paper over the 2000 the number of uh, research articles in, in the domain of local pulse velocity has increased but it has never crossed more than 70 papers even in 2020 or even in uh, you know last to last year so which means this is relatively a new new topic people are getting attracted to the local pulse velocity to do um, you know significant research so we our research team at htic idri madras has been working on this local pulse velocity for the last 7 uh, more than 7 years uh, and we have made a significant uh, you know advancements in this domain of local pulse velocity in terms of its measurement uh, theoretical aspect applications 
um, all all sort of things. I will I will give you um, you know some more details. And one of the interesting fact I um, you know identified in local pulse velocity is that it will give you measure um, beyond your arterial stiffness. That is the uh, you know uh, um, you know different applications of local pulse velocity. For example, so. Um, the local pulse velocity can assist on your iota, like I said, in, in you know, aortic arch or something, or even in this, the major segment of iota will give you a cardiac I mean, hypertrophy or remodeling of your left ventricular uh, performance and all those things. And this is another important application where you can use local pulse velocity measured on the retinal arteries because that will be a very small artery. You can perform the local pulse velocity. Um, you know, there are like a couple of papers in uh, very recently has published uh, by uh, some team by Professor Avolio and team. I can see in retinal hemodynamics and their ocular uh, circulation analysis and all those things. And um, uh, our team itself has developed a very unique and uh, innovative techno method for evaluation the cuffless blood pressure using local pulse velocity. And um, of course, your coronary, coronary artery um, hemodynamics can be evaluated by performing local pulse velocity of the coronary artery at the coronary artery site. And this, um, the last, last but one point is very interesting for me that you can actually evaluate your fetal hemodynamics using local pulse velocity. Because if you can uh, perform a measurement using a non-inversive modality like ultrasound or something on your uh, you know, umbilical artery, how uh, efficiently or uh, the hem uh, fetal uh, blood circulation or the pressure uh, is happening through the uh, fetus can be monitored. So that it can be done only with the local pulse velocity. Regional pulse velocity has zero role on fetal hemodynamics. And uh, of course, classification of the hypertensives and hypertension stages is much more efficient compared to the regional pulse velocity in terms of uh, local pulse velocity. So these are like some, uh, you know, I have just picked up some six points which I would like to discuss during this talk because of our limited time. You can actually go to this uh, paper published by our team. Uh, it's a very uh, advanced uh, research uh, article about 39 pages, fully about local pulse velocity, its theory, methods, advancements, and clinical applications. So uh, it will be appreciated. Uh, you can go and read, then you will get a very clear idea all the from 1922 to 2019. Uh, you will have almost all papers covered uh, in that. Now, we will let us quickly move to how we can measure the uh, local pulse flow velocity. So um, there are, um, I mean, uh, if I'm not wrong, there are about 20 to 25 different methods using various equations, various signals uh, to evaluate local pulse velocity. It's not like a regional pulse velocity where you measure, uh, you know, carotid and femoral pulses and calculate that. So I have been, again, summarized all those methods in this review article. So I here in this, in this presentation, I will not cover everything. I'll just give uh, one or two examples how we can measure because these examples I will be using in subsequent um, slides. So the first one I named or our team has called it as a single site measurement of local pulse velocity. What is happening in this approach is that I can, as you can see here, I'm taking the um, you know common carotid artery. I'm taking a small segment of the common carotid artery about some five centimeter within which I will have a sensor uh, or a combination of sensor can be single model or a multi model sensor, which can evaluate minimum two hemodynamic parameters, for example, pressure diameter or pressure flow or flow diameter. And then you can uh, construct something called hemodynamic loop by plotting one um, parameter along the X axis, another way along the Y axis. And uh, you will uh, find some region where you can calculate the slope of your loop or any other related features of this constructed hemodynamic loop, which will be proportional to the pulse velocity. So I'm generalizing the statement because uh, if you're considering flow and diameter, then uh, the slope or the parameter will be different. Uh, so I will give you one example how we can explore your pressure and diameter. Then another um, method is something called a dual side measurement. This is uh, similar to our regional pulse velocity. Instead of measuring from carotid and femoral, you will be performing the measurement within the carotid artery segment. Like I said, within say three centimeter, within five centimeter, you can record your um, blood pulse waves with a suitable measurement modality at a proximal site and at a distal site, then calculate, uh, you uh, basically you identify one fiducial point which uh, will define 
you know the position or the features of blood pulse propagation here i'm taking the uh, minima or second derivative minima um, of so second derivative maxima of uh, this pulse signal uh, where you calculate what is the time delay from this fiducial point to the uh, fiducial point of the distal cycle once you know the time delay and once you know the distance of um, the segment or where you have captured this one using the fundamental physics you can calculate distance by time um, as a uh, measure of pulse velocity but important point here not to be noted that when you are planning to apply this equation distance by time which is a linear dimension linear, linear wave propagation equation so when you have a branching like this um, for example a branching of the carotid internal and external carotid branching and you are recording one from here and one from here then your equation is not directly applicable because you will have some other phenomenon comes to play uh, um, you know the reflection intensity reflection and changes in the quantity of um, and dimensions or flow the, there are multiple things are coming again i have reported all those concerns in detail about our review paper that's why i'm highlighting that paper here so interested candidates can go and refer that paper in detail um, finally i would like to emphasize a, um, an interesting method which is called the multi site method where instead of measuring your uh, blood pulses from either one or two locations you record it over a segment all the way from your proximal to the distal multiple waveform you can measure once you have that then you can actually make something called the spatio temporal temporal map where you plot uh, your uh, you know um, Uh, what the amplitude along um, amplitude converted into a uh, into a color scale and this plot with respect to time and uh, with respect to path length you will have to see for example if you are taking your uh, say fiducial point at the diastolic minima then you can find that where is the diastolic minima is changing with respect to time and if you fix a line like this then the slope of the line will give you the pulse velocity so the spatio temporal map it is called um so these are the um, you know easy and straightforward method for the evaluation of uh, local pulse velocity into a practical concern you consider in the practical applications now comes to the methodological considerations of uh, performing local pulse velocity of course the first um, priority is for the choice of sensors you can have either an inversive sensor or a non inversive sensor to perform local pulse velocity uh, but when it comes to um, inversive sensor agreed you will be measuring directly from the artery and which will give you the absolute measurement that's called the reference standard uh, of the pulse propagation but it has a limited usability in practice because you can't uh, puncture artery of every subject for doing your first order screening application unless they are in a critical uh, condition and the catheterization is absolute uh, you know um, possible then uh, immediate choice will be non inversive sensors there's a practically feasible method when you uh, comes to you know early stage screening and all those thing you agreed on that but depending upon your selection of the sensors it can be an optical sensor magnetic sensor or ultrasound it can be anything like you will be keeping somewhere in the skin surface then you will be targeting your artery like this so there is another media your tissue is coming in between your uh, you know sensor and artery so you will have to consider what is the tissue transfer function and how this pulse is being coupled with your sensor so is there any uh, a, you know pseudo delay occurred due to the tissue transfer uh, transit delay or in you know, orientation of the artery so all those um, practical things has to be considered depending upon the sensor it is a purely sensor uh, based um, you know parameters second thing is uh, going into the acquisition system so um when you say acquisition system uh, i'm talking about the uh, sensors will be connected to an hardware then there will be software to perform your real time or offline processing and analysis so i'm talking about the hardware uh, where your electrical signals coming from your sensors will be sampled and then will be acquired using a suitable uh, acquisition system so um when you are performing a measurement with two or multi um, site measurements you will have like a minimum 2 to n number of channels if there is exist any inter channel delay that's a pseudo hardware lags 
then uh, your pulse flow velocity transit time will be in the order of about some 5 to 10 millisecond if you are taking an artery segment of say 5 cm it will be in the order of 5 to uh, 5 to 10 or maximum some 15 millisecond then um, if you have an analog filter or any other analog system which are giving a you know um, um, time lag analog system will have its own time constant and time lag that will cause a pseudo delay which will result into an error in your measurement so that has to be considered so there are different method how you can compensate for your interchannel delay how you can ensure that a negligible or uh, ideally zero interchannel delay which um, our team has put a significant effort over the last few years and summarized in various papers and it is also in the paper which i cited here in this uh, review article so i'm not going to deep into that so let us comes to the second point about the sampling rate this is another important factor because you as i said need to have um, uh, i mean you will have a pulse uh, transit delay between your proximal and distal side about some 10 millisecond then uh, your temporal resolution is absolute important here when you sample your signal at a very low sampling rate for example 50 hertz as i shown here in this signal when i accurate at 50 hertz you can see that my sample points are located by significantly different uh, you know um, gap is existing between my first and second sample even if i do an interpolation there is a uh, possibility of having an aperture error or jitter error can happen into uh, picture so that will affect your local pulse velocity even your local pulse velocity is uh, a, say for example um, you know got an error by 2 millisecond which is resulting into almost 20 millisecond compared to your uh, 10 millisecond uh, propagation delay so always go for a higher sampling rate for example if i give a 500 hertz here then you will have uh, you know real uh, signals which are captured at uh, you know close um, locations then your jitter error and other conductivity noise and everything will be very minimal even if you are going for an interpolation then it will not affect too much so um, higher the sampling rate is better the resolution for local pulse velocity and that is always appreciated third point to be considered when it comes to the methodology is that the signal conditioning immediately after your signal acquisition you will be going for some kind of a signal processing uh, you know we will be doing all sort of signal processing which we are well aware of that band pass low pass notch or whatever required filters and everything we will put into play you really have to think what is actually required and you have to optimize uh, your signal uh, processing blocks and one thing has to be uh, make sure that you should follow identical uh, signal processing block across the multiple channel where identical signals are being uh, processed that is an important uh, parameter to be considered and wherever possible do a simultaneous processing of this signal so that it will be uh, much more confident and much more easy to analyze at a later stage um coming to uh, the again signal conditioning thing i would like to highlight um, a bit more about the filter specifications so um selection of the filter in i have seen typically in students and you know phd scholars they will be typically randomly trying multiple filters and which is giving you the best repeatable signal will be considered as the best signal uh, filter combinations i mean at least in uh, some uh, places but uh, that's uh, so what we have done an experiment so i think you all aware that our blood pulse will be propagating um, all the blood pulses will have a frequency range of about 0.5 hertz to 3.5 hertz in uh, humans depending upon i mean over a wide physiological range it will be somewhere in 0.5 to 3.5 hertz so at least third harmonics has to be considered when you do local pulse velocity analysis if heart rate is fine heart rate you can you know filter it is very nicely uh, you can you know beautifully show that you are getting very good signals but when it comes to local pulse velocity you have to consider at least third harmonic you look at this graph here so what uh, my colleague rajkiran has done that he has collected the signal over longer um period on multiple uh, subject and he has developed some analysis uh, so um as you can see we theoretically calculated what is the pulse velocity expected for that particular measurement condition and what is the pulse velocity measured i mean and then we started filtering uh, with a different cut off frequency and different orders and see how what is the root mean square error compared to the theoretical values so um, like i said 10 after 10 hertz you can see up to close to some 20 hertz if we are getting the lowest root mean square error at different orders 
as soon as you go less than nine or eight, uh, you, your root mean square is increasing. Like I said, you are not considering at least third harmonics. You are just in, uh, going for uh, maybe second harmonics. Somewhere you coming here, you are just considering the first harmonics. You will get a very nice signal, but beautifully, uh, you know, um, with um, increasing diacritic notch, everything. But that doesn't mean that you are getting accurate values. So again, when you go beyond 20 hertz, also it is not required because your signals, um, typically the uh, blood pulse signals has an harmonics up to 20 hertz. So the, um, there is no point of going beyond that, then you will be considering more ambient noise into calculation. So the ideal range as per our calculations will be somewhere between 10 and 15 and always go for a higher order filter uh, for a better performance. So these are the very basic and you know, uh, you know, um, you know first two, three uh, checklist you have to consider when it is comes to uh, methodological considerations of this one. Now, uh, let us start with uh, some of the sensors and methods which we have developed uh, in our premises. Uh, before going to that, when you say a non-inversive device for local pulse velocity, the first picture coming to our mind will be an ultrasound based device. Because ultrasound is much more, uh, I mean, it is a well advanced technology nowadays. You can access any artery, maybe IOTA or any other arteries, even deeper arteries with a suitable frequency and probe to capture the pulses like this and evaluate the pulse flow velocity of that. But uh, that technology is appreciated. Even some most of the research publication nowadays is actually doing ultrasound based analysis. But only thing to consider that the ultrasound may not have a very uh, high frame rate. Uh, like I said, your sampling rate is nothing but a frame rate when it comes to ultrasound. Uh, but uh, of course, in recent um, the models, there are even very high number of sampling rate versions also available. My concern is not about that. My concern is that if you really want to perform local pulse velocity as an early tool to detect the cardiovascular disease progression, you will have to go to the population level measurements. So the feasibility of carrying ultrasound uh, at a population level, like an ultrasound machine of this big size, um, the feasibility of carrying to a population level is still limited. Okay, there are portable versions of ultrasound, which is a different topic to consider. And um, another accurate way of uh, measuring pulse velocity is nothing but uh, MRI based uh, method. Of course, there is no point of discussing uh, MRI taking into field at this uh, point. So what, um, so considering this practical limitation, and of course in, in India, we have even much more, uh, you know, complicated um, um, government rules and something related to PNDT, taking ultrasound into the field and doing measurements and all. Um, since we have participants from every country, it's not worth discussing about that particular portion. So um, there exists a limit uh, in terms of performing, um, you know, this kind of uh, screening at a population level using ultrasound or MRI based devices. So it has been uh, well written and quantified uh, by um, some of the reverse, I mean, articles by Peters and Sergis, you can also refer that. It is very well established a factor. Uh, ultrasound has its own limitations. Now, to address this, um, our team uh, in HTAC has uh, developed some, uh, you know, easy to use non-inversive sensors for performing local pulse velocity um, at, uh, in the hospital scenario, field scenario, or at a population level. I, I would like to quickly go through uh, those designs and how we have validated those technologies. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, one of the device uh, which we have developed called the dual element magnetic bethysmogram transducer, which as you can see here, we are using a new medium disc magnet and a um, hall of magnetic sensor, which are kept um, small separation about 30 mm apart. As you can see here, myself is performing a measurement on my colleague, um, which is keeping on the carotid artery and it will evaluate the um, proximal and distal pulse waves. So how it is performing, it is based on this arrangement. So you have a magnetic sensor at the proximal site and a similar magnetic sensor at a distal site. And this position and everything is highly optimized so that there will not be any cross coupling. Now, when a blood pulse is propagating from, uh, you know, uh, through the artery, your magnetic field will be getting any, uh, get a disturbance. Uh, and that disturbance of the magnetic field will be proportional to the rate of, propagation of your um, volume or the blood. 
which will be picked up by the sensor, a Hall effect sensor, and which will be give you um, pulse waves like this. Once you have proximal distal pulses, or using our dual method, dual point method, we can evaluate pulse velocity. Very detailed discussion about this design, design considerations, optimization are there in our subsequent in a series of publications. So interested um, participants can go and refer them for future uh, you know, analysis and all those things. Now we evaluated the performance of this device using an in vitro um, setup where we have an uh, artery um, simulating model where blood is propagating through, the art uh, through an artery elastic pipe inside this uh, arm. And we uh, used a reference device because uh, getting a reference device for local pulse velocity is tricky. There are not many devices for local pulse velocity. And we made a dual tonometer arrangement. So uh, to pick up the proximal and distal pulses, this SPT301 uh, pulse, pulse wave tonometer by Miller were used in, in uh, combination with the Power Lab and Bridge Jam and Lab Chat by AD instrument. So I think all of you are aware of the tonometer, but if somebody has a very um, little idea, I will just put a, uh, you know, a word on that. So tonometer is an electromechanical system which has a mechanical and electrical system combined into it. Now, when you want to measure an, a pulse wave or a pressure wave from an artery, you have to apply a something called hold on pressure. When you apply hold on pressure towards the target artery, the artery will start applanating. So that is, called, that is the name called applanation tonometry. Okay. Now, this uh, applied pressure applied pressure will become balanced by or it will be opposed to by your uh, internal pressure. And the resultant transmural pressure will give you the uh, respective uh, pressure waveform. This is how the tonometer is generating signal. It is highly sensitive. You can uh, keep uh, even a setup like this to uh, pick up the pulses. Now, we kept our system in a similar manner and evaluated the transit time and the pulse velocity between these two locations at a different um, uh, pulse rate or propagation speeds and found that our system is comparable to what tonometer has given by 99% accuracy. And uh, with these results, we continued with uh, um, a human experiment where uh, we this experiment was okay i will come to that this experiment was conducted uh, to examine the uh, performance of the device on human subject at the same rate how it is associated with the blood pressure so what we have done is we measured the blood pressure at the first phase then measured the local pulse velocity using our device at the carotid artery then we asked the subject to do a running exercise through a staircase then again repeated the same procedure. So we will have the baseline values of the pulse velocity and the blood pressure and uh, pulse velocity and blood pressure at an excised uh, condition, um, physically um, you know, increased condition. So as you can see, the device was able to pick up the changes in the pulse wave velocity um, induced by uh, increased pressure in the human body. So the black dots are corresponding to physically relaxed condition. Green reds are corresponding to the post exercise condition. We also found a significant correlation between your pulse velocity and the blood pressure. This experiment was start of uh, the blood pressure measurement technology, which I have mentioned earlier. Local pulse velocity can be used to evaluate the uh, blood pressure. Um, the second design, and it's not about uh, optimizing the design. We have been developing the devices for various applications. So another design is something called the single source photoplethysmogram, where I have two um, photo detectors kept it at about some 25 mm apart. And I have an exciting source, uh, an IR LED, which will excite the artery under investigation. And whenever the pulse is reaching at the bottom, this sensor will pick up a pulse and will give you another pulse um, at the distal site. Now, by calculating the time delay between those two pulses, again, you can evaluate the pulse wave velocity. So this, this design is, again, all our designs are pro patent protected. This design is particularly is a very unique one because it has only a single source to excite both transducers. So there will not be any chance of coupling between uh, proximal excitation and distal excitation. So uh, we have again done an experimental validations to evaluate its performance. We used another set of fandom where um, our sensor was kept and two tonometers was arranged in the proximal and distal. Then we recorded the signal using the tonometer from the proximal and distal side. You can see how the tonometer is giving my proximal and distal uh, pressure signals. 
and my ppg signal is giving um, you know uh, plot of phthalmographic signal from the proximal distal side when we evaluated the transit time delay we found that these are comparable so we uh, used this hand bulb to uh, you know induce various pressure conditions so that i was increasing my pressure from a minimum to a maximum then i was coming back to a lower value and found that the local pulse velocity were within an error of plus or minus 1 meter per second excuse me further to this experiment um, you know you can actually uh, see that we have developed something called the post exercise recovery curve of local pulse velocity mm, it is simple in theory what we have done is um, yeah this is myself was running on a treadmill similarly we have some 25 30 subjects were running on a treadmill uh, after performing their baseline measurement mm, they were increased uh, their i mean they were running about 10 minute at uh, uh, a step wise increase 1 km 2 km per hour up to 10 km per hours then increased their blood pressure up to uh, somewhere around um, you know um, 50 to 80 mmhg higher than uh, the systolic uh, condition that was a, a significant excession then we recorded uh, their pulse wave velocity blood pressure parameters and heart rate during their recovery phase continuously you can see that uh, the pulse velocity is been reducing after after i mean post exercise during the relaxation condition so during the transit phase there is a significant decrease then uh, they are actually coming to the recovery phase and you can see that it is coming back to a baseline uh, slowly so this experiment give a very clear picture that is uh, no and, and again i just want to add one more point so this graph is for a single subject when you do analysis for multiple subject the um, the transit phase time uh, their intensity everything is different so um, subject specific variations were it was evident across uh, the um, ender uh, study so we got a very clear idea that um, pulse wave velocity based blood pressure is indeed uh, very much possible and we have developed the subject specific models to quantify how pulse velocity and the blood pressure parameters are related so we found that uh, empirical model like blood pressure is equal to an arbitrary constant a multiplied by the logarithm of pulse velocity offset by another arbitrary constant b is these are subject specific parameters now for example uh, for one particular subject you we got an equation like this similarly we got equations for multiple subject and we evaluated so using this equation we evaluated like this we kept this uh, transducer on their neck um, to you know record the um, local pulse velocity then we estimated the pulse uh, blood pressure and compared uh, using a bland altimeter examination we found that within uh, plus or minus 5 or maximum of 6 min plus or minus 6 was the mmhg difference in systolic and uh, similarly plus or minus 5 in difference was in the diastolic so this uh, was again published in um, you know physiological measurements so detailed discussion is readily available there i am just giving an overall idea of this uh, method then um, yeah for a different application so still now i was talking about uh, you know magnetic magnetic or optical sensors we have also developed something called the ultrasound based system where this is purely based on our um, on uh, custom developed art sense technology this is originally developed by um, my faculty dr jaira joseph um, at iit madras um, it is um, you know using a single element ultrasound transducer to send a pulse get a um, pulse back and we uh, evaluate the dimensions of the artery the change in the artery as you can see the distension of waveform without constructing an image so this artsense technology is an image free ultrasound technology for measuring dimensions of the artery so um, details about the artsense technology will be available on its website artsense.tech so this technology was leveraged and instead of using one transducer we have used two transducers separated by a non distance about some 30 mm apart and we were able to record the like i said a mode ultrasound frames from proximal and distal side correspondingly diameter from the proximal and distal side once you have the proximal distance diameter you can again calculate what is the time delay between those diameter waves evaluate local pulse velocity accordingly so the um, design and details of this sensors is again available on uh, the paper here so uh, to performance evaluation of that sensor was done 
using an experimental setup like this where we pump a blood mimicking fluid through um, at a different flow rate and different pressure levels through an artery fandom which is an elastic artery fandom uh, kept it there and we arranged our system like this and um, you know um, some spr 82 micro tip catheter from miller was used at the entrance and uh, to i mean at the proximal and at the distal site because we have been using two sensors to pick up uh, the pressure from internal pressure from proximal distal and compare its uh, performance against what we got. It was comparable. And at the same time, uh, we have also got a highly repeatable measurements uh, from the fandom with, uh, with an error, uh, like, you know, um, standard deviation less than uh, 0.4 and the B2B variation is about 1.4 percentage, which indicate the reliability of using our sensors for local pulse wave velocity. Now, we conducted an interesting experiment using these sensors um, to see uh, how efficiently it can pick up the variations of local pulse velocity with respect to blood pressure changes. What we have done that um, we performed an intervention using lower body negative pressure chamber. So what you are seeing is a lower body negative pressure chamber. Myself is gone all the way inside this chamber. And um, we are having our, um, you know, dual element ultrasound transducer to perform local pulse velocity kept it on the carotid artery. And the human non-inversive blood pressure and BP by AD instruments has kept it on the finger to record the continuous blood pressure changes during the intervention. So this is the result. Um, as you can see, during the baseline, we are been recording continuously how the blood pressure is changing, and we are also recording the pulse wave velocity. As soon as you induce a negative pressure, that is almost 40 mmHg negative pressure, so that there will be blood pooling will happen at your lower body, and the upper body will have a reduced blood supply, reduced blood pressure. So you can see that all the way it is reducing uh, by about uh, you know uh, 20 mmHg uh, systole. And um, the pulse wave velocity, as I said, is a function of blood pressure, which is found to be reducing in proportion to reduction in the blood pressure. When you release the pressure, come back to the atmospheric condition again, you can see that this value is again increasing and reaching a similar trend is being followed by our sensor, which indicates the you know, sensitivity of the sensor to perform uh, local pulse velocity in a um, you know, dynamic conditions. Um, yeah. Now, the fourth transducer is about ultrasound tonometric uh, vascular probe, which is a very unique design and a patented one where we have used a tonometer and an ultrasound transducer, which I already explained to you. Um, like this, a tonometer was used and our ultrasound transducer uh, of the ArtSense was used and they were integrated together to form a compact size about 8 mm center to center distance, which theoretically you are actually, you know, measuring uh, pulse velocity from a single site uh, in an artery. So um, you, once you do measurement of your pressure and the diameter simultaneously using this arrangement, you will get your pressure diameter waveforms recorded from a theoretically or maybe practically you can't achieve from a single site within 8 mm or less than one centimeter gap for, um, you know, pressure diameter recorded from there. Here comes the importance of having the first method I have mentioned that's called the one, one point method. So using that pressure and diameter, we have constructed something called the pressure diameter loop. When you have the pressure diameter loop, you can evaluate the slope of uh, the pressure diameter loop in the systolic phase at every pressure point. So you can uh, calculate what is dp by dd at any given pressure point. Knowing this dp by dd value, you can substitute into the Bramwell Hill equation, which I have explained. This is the modified version of the Bramwell Hill equation when you want to perform you know, pulse velocity in a continuous manner. You can actually get measurement on the human subject uh, all the way from your diastolic pressure to the systolic pressure. So you can actually see that your pulse wave velocity is changing from a minimum value to a maximum value when your cardiac cycle is increasing pressure from diastole to systole. So this parameter we call the incremental pulse flow velocity where pulse velocity is increasing from a minimal to maximum. Um, so that has been, um, I mean, of course it was introduced in 1922 and it was overlooked by all the researchers. In 2018, our team has reinvented this concept and we have developed uh, you know, various methods of calibration free technology for cuffless evaluation of blood pressure using this concept. Um, related uh, discussions on everything is 
and I'm published in respective uh, you know, uh, scientific articles. You can also refer the local pulse velocity review paper, which I have mentioned, where I have uh, provided very detailed discussion about this incremental pulse velocity concept. So these are the four transducers which I would like to share with you today. Before closing this one, I would also want to uh, you know, introduce uh, something called the inversely sensors for local pulse velocity. So here, um, I'm just giving one example of an inversely transducer available from Miller. It is SPR751, uh, which is separated by about 30 centimeter apart. There are two pressure transducers available in the same catheter. So previously in one of my experiments, I have used two individual catheters, but that practically challenge, practical challenges are there using such an arrangement. So when you have a dual pressure catheter like this, you can insert directly into any animal uh, into their, uh, you know, you have to, of course, purchase up to the respective French size into any target artery. You can record the pulse verse from your, uh, you know, proximal sensor and crystal sensor. As you can see here, I have uh, captured um, over a longer period of time. Now this distance is fixed and it will be a standard size. It is 30 mm as per for this uh, particular model concern. So you know what is the time delay internally within the artery. So you can calculate what is the local pulse velocity there. That is the reference standard as of now, uh, in my opinion, that you can the best ach achievable for a reference standard for local pulse velocity. You have to put the catheter all the way inside to the artery. You are uh, literally measuring from the artery. There is no tissue comes to play. There is no other measurement considerations will be there. You will be recording. Of course, it is an invasive procedure. Invasive procedure related complications has to be considered. Um, so all those discussions, what all uh, um, you know, has to be considered when you do such kind of uh, inversive measurement is again reported in a review article. Um, so that is a bit of very like you know very detailed. So far, to my knowledge, that is the only review article written in local pulse velocity. So um, whatever I have explained here is having you know detailedly given by. Myself and my co-authors, uh, Raj Kiran, Dr. Jairaj Joseph, Abhidev, and Dr. Mohan Shingashwar Prakasham, my director of uh, the center HDIC. Now, finally, let us uh, see uh, what all we have discussed today. Then uh, we started with the need for an improved uh, early stage risk assessment tool or marker. Then we have also discussed about the regional versus local pulse velocity, why they are different and what is the importance of local pulse velocity, what are the specific clinical applications when it is comes to local pulse velocity and the measurement and methodological considerations of local pulse velocity. Then I have also discussed and disclosed some of the design development and validations of in our HTIC's local pulse velocity sensors. So that's all for today. I think uh, Thanks for your patience and uh, we can have some questions uh, if you guys have any. Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful talk. Uh, I believe uh, the participants would have enjoyed the talk. So now the session is open for questions. So we have... Uh, yeah, have yeah. I'm, I'm okay. Uh, we can we go have received questions. so many questions. I will just read out, sir. Uh, uh, yeah. There is a question from Dr. Josna Gumasta. PWA is better indicator at younger age and the pulse wave velocity in older age. Is this true? Um, it is not uh, directly comparable. We can, uh, there are, I mean, th those are different aspects of analyzing the uh, pulse waves. Pulse wave analysis is uh, purely based on um, on a, uh, you know, a single pulses and you're looking for the morphological changes, how it is happening over a longer period. Like you said, if you, uh, the pulse wave, I mean, morphological changes it will happen uh, significantly at a younger stage. So, um, I mean, especially if there is any augmentation or something is happening at a younger stage, it will be easy to detect in the pulse wave analysis. So, both has its own advantages and limitations. Uh, pulse wave velocity, like you mentioned, um, it will be significantly higher at a uh, younger age. So, we are looking. Uh, you know, how we can perform such an analysis at, uh, you know, early stages. So, um, there in my, I don't think there is any studies which has, I mean, I have not come across any study which are done a very uh, reliable analysis of um, log, I mean, pulse wave analysis versus um, pulse velocity. So, it has its own advantage as well as limitations, but pulse wave analysis for a younger population will uh, changes will be very, uh, I mean, if there is any changes, then pulse analysis will give you a better reflection. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, there is one question from uh, uh, Vidya. 
based on what do we choose the distance between the two sensors distal and proximal based on what do we choose the distance between uh, distal and proximal so uh, it is again depending on uh, what kind of sensor you are using for example uh, if you are going for a um, you know photoplethysmogram sensors um it typically consider the sender of your photo detector to the sender of other photo detector so um, where because a photo detector it is a window we can't uh, consider all i um, mean like entire space and its distance it has to be between two points right so in our applications we do consider um between um sender to sender of the photo detector when it is comes to ultrasound again it is the sender to sender of uh, the, uh, the sensors so uh, it is uh, i mean it's not a very generic uh, statement but you can uh, see how the sensors are uh, you know doing um, uh, how the sensors i mean what is the characteristics of the sensor for signal acquisition um if the signal concentration is happening at the center then it is always go with the center to center in the sense thank you sir um, so next question if you are interested in arterial stiffness how can you be sure an elevated pulse wave velocity reflects artery stiffness and not something else like blood pressure is there a way to correct for a blood pressure to just have a measure of stiffness um yeah that is a tricky question and people are even working on that one there is some co concept called the pressure independent pulse wave velocity so i mean there is uh, two um, groups in the end research domain uh, whether it is a pressure dependent or a pressure independent and there have been multiple attempts like um, you know um, um, deriving pressure independent estimates uh, uh, of pulse wave velocity for example um, the carotid angle vascular index is claimed to be an estimate a pressure independent estimate which consider pulse wave velocity so um, there are methods and there are uh, you know efforts required to make it happen um, i mean pulse velocity is is basically a function of that when you do analysis considering blood pressure as a confounding factor of course statistical methods will allow to do that pressure you can uh, adjust for your blood pressure and then uh, do analysis that is the only way which is currently available it is a function of blood pressure thank you sir so there is one uh, very interesting talk i see a lot of development made during last 20 years can you please mention if you have developed an instrument to be used in a gp setting like spigma manometer um we uh, we have been uh, working on this one and we uh, have a device called artsense which can actually perform measurement of local and uh, regional pulse velocity values uh, using ultrasound and uh, uh, you know devices but the device has not yet in market it is on the final validation stages um it is um it is like a comprehensive i mean it's like a complete device which will give you detailed um you know examination of your vascular stiffness uh, at a regional level your uh, carotid femoral pulse velocity at a, sorry um, first one vascular carotid stiffness at a local level carotid femoral pulse velocity at a regional level and also the central blood pressure and peripheral blood pressure parameters i have given the website here in the page itself artsense technology artsense.tech can go and see that uh, it is of course it's not yet in the market uh, it is uh, in the currently final stage of uh, clinical Uh, verification thank you sir so we can expect something in uh, future uh, yeah of course of course near future there is one question from dr prathamesh uh, can we use these sensors on radial artery um these sensors on the radial artery we have tried uh, the magnetic lithosmogram transducer which i have mentioned is possible to use in the radial artery um but getting local pulse velocity from the radial artery using those two sensors was bit tricky but it is doable but uh, if you are planning for like any um, you know pulse counter analysis or heart rate detection then definitely all those sensors are um, except the ultrasound sensors uh, is uh, radial artery is applicable okay so and there is question from uh, dr danilakshmi 
what is the compromise in results when we compare signals based on analysis with images for carotid artery applications though the complexity is very much reduced in the case of signal um compromise in the results uh, see that is uh, what um, i have mentioned when you are comparing two devices those two devices um is expected to give uh, you know um, same frame rate or same sampling rate and all those things otherwise the values will be completely not completely but there will be uh, error because of the methodological considerations when you come when you are using an ultrasound device with a low frame rate then low frame rate um, diameter is what going to you are going to get like some you know um, 70 frames uh, per uh, second or something if you are going to capture then you will have only hardly 70 points in a cycle um, you have to do um, you know sampling of those cycles to get a better resolution um, and then calculate the local pulse velocity on the other hand if you have um, other sensors like uh, what i have shown here all those sensors are, we are actually capturing at a very high sampling rate like some 10000 ksps and all those things were you know literally point to point you can see how much microsecond error is only expected so um, when you do over sampling depending upon your uh, you know when you have a low low frame rate and you do over sampling then there will be an error there will be error um that error not necessarily due to the um, you know device comparisons uh, because there's a methodological limitation so um, there are uh, high frame rate ultrasound systems are readily available nowadays so we can go with the high frame rate ultrasound system uh, we can um, have a comparable results results when i say physio i mean when you say results are comparable physiological uh, acquisition itself is modality is different if you going for ultrasound it is actually going to the wall and capturing the signal from there when i'm using an, a magnetic sensor it is sending it is kept on the skin surface and uh, so um, error can happen because of the mo modality difference itself that difference is what we want to consider not the you know devices its own limitation to uh, you know one uh, higher frame rate signal can't be directly compared with a low frame rate signal so that is the one challenge that's what i was saying that the tonometer is a good one where you can uh, have your pressure captured at two different locations um it will give a I mean relatively higher i think and now i mean in all our applications we have captured a tonometer with our own acquisition system with very high sampling rate 10000 ksps and so that is is it, it's it is not a slightly answerable question it is a device specific yes sir so there is one question like uh, do we use two recording tonometers working at the same time or one tonometer record subsequently at two distance point um okay there are two method to capture the pulses one is sequential method and simultaneous method what i prefer and follow is the simultaneous method where you record um, two sensors from the proximal distal location using identical sampling rate and identical hardware channel with zero interchannel delay okay that's the point um then you are um, you know capturing uh, same pulses which are coming at the proximal and distal there are a sequential method where you will have an ecg reference you will record ecg um, and your pulses from one location then you calculate what is the time delay between say r peak to your fiduciary point uh, for the first signal then you keep your sensor at a distal location calculate what is the time delay between r peak to that point just calculate the time difference but what happens that that approach sequential approach will not be appreciated when you have a pressure variations happening in the body so in human body it's not like a machine you can't just tune it right the in every beat there will be decrease and increase in the blood pressure values so uh, especially when you do an intervention studies like i have shown uh, the lower body negative pressure intervention um simultaneous acquisition is required sequential acquisition will not be working in that case because intervention um, intensities will be different yeah thank you sir so there are uh, so many questions can we uh, can we answer uh, a few more somebody vidya i just want to answer this question as an important one does the morphology of the wave at a different arteries vary due to the elasticity of course that is that is uh, expected um as the elasticity is changing and as the um, artery is moving away from the heart Uh, your morphology will be different because your um, diameter the i mean artery the system is a heterogeneous system uh, your diameter changes your branching increases your reflection intensity will be different i mean as away from the heart your artery become uh, muscular 
so there will be morphological change is very um, that is significant it is evident so um, that is one of the limitations of using a regional pulse velocity uh, and that is why i was uh, emphasizing perform the measurement on the same branch for local pulse velocity otherwise your diff I mean, morphological difference will be there now when you say fiducial point which will not be corresponding fiducial point i have given a very detailed explanation about this one in my review article i would suggest to read that please thank you sir there are so many questions i think uh, yeah, I this know. time uh, we will already yeah uh, we will uh, collect the questions and we will try to uh, send the answers through mail oh huh, that will be good yeah. so thank yeah. you so much sir uh, now i would My like, uh, uh, i would welcome uh, sandeep to close the session yeah thank uh, you thank you dr nabil thank you for enlightening our webinar with uh, your knowledge i hope it was really a wonderful session for all the participants who attended this webinar uh, thanks everyone for joining our webinar hope to see you again in the next coming webinar maybe on transonic we are going to run our webinar on transonic in january so hope to connect with you all in this webinar also thank you dr nabil once again thanks for joining us